Broadcasting live from the Capital OTB Studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning. This is Racing Across America, and I am Seth Merrill. Thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciate you stopping by on a Sunday morning. Uh, and as usual, we'll do a little recapping of nice stakes action yesterday. And go back to Friday, too, to take a look at Master of the Seas. Um, also, we'll do a little handicapping, some news and notes and whatnot on a uh, nice Sunday morning here in the Capital District. As I think I saw the news yesterday, 60 today, tomorrow maybe into Tuesday and then cool off a little bit. Uh, but uh, we, I, I think winter is in the rear view mirror and we're on our way to spring here in upstate New York, hopefully. Um, do want to remind you that here at the Clubhouse Racebook today, one more day of pick and putt as uh, we are at the final day of the Masters. You can come down and watch the uh, golf, watch all the horse racing action as well, and maybe have a little fun with our putting green. Uh, we'll select people randomly throughout the afternoon to step up to the green and putt for prizes. So come on down to the Clubhouse Race Book this afternoon, 711 Central Avenue in Albany. All right. It was a nice uh, stakes day yesterday at Oaklawn and at Keeneland as well. And so why don't we start out uh, taking a look at those venues and um, – Grade one action at Oaklawn yesterday, $1.25 million up for grabs in the grade one apple blossom, mile and a 16th. Horse to beat was clearly going to be a dare manner. I took a little shot with Misty Vale, who a 12 to 1 on the morning line, she went off at 33 to 1. I've liked her all season lockdown at Oaklawn, and she's been hitting the board at prices. Unfortunately, yesterday in the Apple Blossom just did not shake out that way for uh, Mistyville. She wound up eighth in the field of nine. I had that one, as I said, I took a little swing with her. I had a Dare Manor right underneath. She was clearly the horse to beat. A Dare Manor went off at uh, three to five and gets it done and gets it done pretty impressively. You would have to think she's the number four horse here, uh, took them all the way around. Uh, you would have to think she becomes a serious player uh, for the rest of the year in the Philly and Mayor division. Uh, Bob Baffert, I believe I read, uh, said she heads back to Southern California today. Uh, so we'll see what they have planned for her going forward. Flying Connection number five at 26 to one runs second and free like a girl. At uh, what six fifty eight to one runs third in there, um, so a nice performance uh, all the way around uh, for those. Uh, although the clear performance, uh, what's the chart margin five and a half lengths? The clear, clear performance is a dare manner. Uh, I didn't see any numbers, but I'm, I would think this would be a pretty solid number for a dare manner. Uh, Baffert and Hernandez with this grade one in the Apple Blossom pick up the grade ones down at uh, Oaklawn because they also won the Arkansas Derby with Muth. Uh, and nice performance, as I say, by the winner. Now, uh, again, Misty Vale, betting public uh, wasn't as convinced as I was, but Misty Vale, in 10 starts prior at Oaklawn, had hit the exact at seven times, been third a couple more times. So it only missed the board once down at Oaklawn. But as I say yesterday, with the betting public being right, I guess, at 33 to 1, uh, but they've let her escape at prices before, she disappoints. Uh, the other disappointment for me uh, was wet paint. I had wet paint in my mix. Uh, the really nice three-year-old filly from last year for Brad Cox and Godolphin making her four-year-old debut. She went off as the second choice, yeah, second choice at 7 to 2. She wound up sixth in the field of nine. So it was, it was uh, no question, rough spot to, to make your debut um, in the four-year-old season off a layoff going back to the Breeders' Cup distaff. And she kind of clunked in there a little bit. So now a couple of tries against older have not been as good as the three-year-old season where towards the end of her three-year-old season, just before the, the Breeders' Cup races, she had two starts up at Saratoga, the win in the Alabama and the second, uh, the win in the Coaching Club American Oaks and the second in the Alabama behind Randomized. Um, she'd won the Fantasy last year here at Oaklawn, fourth behind Pretty Mischievous in the Kentucky Oaks. So again, she had a nice uh, three-year-old season, 
but now going against Older at the end of that season in the Breeders' Cup, this staff, and to kick off this season in the Apple Blossom, her two tries against Older Phillies have not been as good. I, I have to believe, given what we saw last year, she'll prove to be okay against uh, the Older Phillies and Mares, but it's going to be interesting to see where they go next and uh, how she does, you know, with now uh, – a race under the belt to start the four-year-old season. I didn't hear any comments or read any comments from uh, Brad Cox on her. But as they say, a dare manner, they said, uh, heading back to Southern California, and they'll kind of plot out where to go with her for the remainder of the year. Um, but she clearly is, as I say, a player in that division of the uh, Phillies and Mayors. Also on the card yesterday uh, at Oaklawn, the Count Fleet Sprint Six furlongs the trip, half a million dollars up for grabs. And I said yesterday when I had Matt Dinnerman on, this is really one of the fun early season sprint stakes in the country, I think, has become so. I took a little shot with Tejano Twist um, just too far out of it early. Tejano Twist is going to make a nice late run, but it's it's too late. And I don't know whether we were going to get Skelly anyway. Skelly's the number four horse that was the clear and justifiable favorite. Uh, you will see Tejano twist the number six horse run late to get up and be a nice second with a nice late run. Uh, happy is a choice runs third, but the chart margin winds up to be three. Again, Tejano twist closes ground, but was just way towards the back of the pack uh, at the back of the pack for much of the race. So too much work to do for my pick Tejano twist wound up to be the second choice at five to two. But again, too much work to do, but I don't know whether we were uh, going to get the winner anyway. Skelly, uh, a horse that uh, has a great record at Oaklawn and is just a bona fide, uh, talented, stakes-quality sprinter for Steve Asmussen, who's had so many very, very good sprinters just over the past, what, five years or so. Um, Skelly is now seven for nine at Oaklawn. Uh, that was the fifth stakes win of the career overall, the fourth stakes win for Skelly at Oaklawn. Uh, it's been an interesting season so far. Debuted uh, late off May last year, because you might say, yeah, talented sprinter for uh, Asmussen, and wasn't at Saratoga last summer? Well, laid off from May until uh, December, the very end of December, December 30th, came back at Oak Lawn, won an optional claimer, then went into the King Cotton early in February, won that very easily, triple-digit buyer. Then they took a swing and went to Saudi Arabia, ran second in the uh, rich stakes race there, and they come back. And that I, I put Skelly underneath and took the shot with Tejano Twist just on them. <laughs> How's the horse going to perform? coming back from Saudi Arabia? Well, that question was answered. Just spurred it out of the gate, and 21 and change, 43 and change, 56 and change, 108.82. Again, I didn't see any numbers. Going to be totally intrigued to see what uh, Skelly comes up with with a buyer figure. A and intrigued to see now where we go the rest of the year. And will we see Skelly up at Saratoga being an Asmussen runner? This was certainly a player in the sprint division. And as I said yesterday and just a couple minutes ago, this to me has been kind of a fun early season sprint stake, at least going back the past few years. And I went and looked it, uh, looked it up just going back really just a few years, what, six years or so, uh, some of the names that have gotten the job done in this count fleet down at Oaklawn. Last year, Skelly, uh, part of that run of nice wins uh, at Oaklawn for Skelly, for Steve Asmussen, obviously. Two years ago, it was also Steve Asmussen with the talented Jackie's Warrior. Year before that, the very nice CZ Rocket. The year before that was Whitmore uh, in 2019. Again, it was Asmussen with Matoli. And in 2017 and 18, it was Whitmore. So Whitmore, Matoli, uh, Whitmore multiple times, Jackie's Warrior, Skelly last year and this year. Um, they, as I say, this Count Fleet Sprint is, uh, has become a really nice uh, early season sprint stakes race on the uh, American racing calendar. And yesterday, no exception. Twitter was a buzz with the performance by Skelly and Adair Manor. Uh, both of those stakes yesterday at Oaklawn attracted attention and certainly in their divisions, 
you would expect will play out the rest of the year with those winners. All right, let's go back to um, Keeneland yesterday. They had some nice stakes action as well. Lexington, um, I, I said yesterday, had some derby potential, focusing mainly on Hades, um, who with the points was going to bounce into the field, and they were taking their shot. Hades, unfortunately, and they kind of set after the race with Hades. We're going to step back and kind of regroup. You know, we had to come back quickly to try to get some points. It didn't work out. Hades was seventh yesterday in the uh, the field of nine. But it did work out uh, derby-wise. The winner is now sitting firmly on the bubble, is 21 of 20, and deterministic, who is in the 20, is iffy to go. And so uh, the winner yesterday, Encino, may be going, and Brad Cox said afterwards we'll have to decide uh, where to go if we get in. It's going to be either Derby or the Preakness next, um, so we'll see. But Encino is the number eight horse here on the inside, the wine steward, the number two uh, challenges. I had these two, one, two. I was a little bit disappointed with the price on Encino. We were five to one on the morning line, eventually went off at three to one. The favorite was the wine store at seven to five. I was a little bit shocked there. The wine store was a short price on the morning line of five to two and was certainly talented. And I think the betting public looked, and justifiably so, as it turns out, uh, at that race at Keeneland last fall, the Breeders' Futurity, where the wine steward and Locke hooked up in a stretch battle that Locke just got uh, as they got to the wire over the wine steward. <clears throat> and I think folks were looking at that and kind of trying to, uh, hoping that you know, the horse was coming back off of that, the layoff since that race in good form and did, I think, to, to be second um, in there but just could not get by Encino. Again, Encino, 5-1 to one on the morning line. They made that one the 3-1 to one second choice. I was a little bit surprised, but I guess, I guess people were seeing what I saw. The horse was a little bit interesting from Brad Cox and Godolphin. Uh, debuted at uh, Turfway end of December and ran a close-up second. Broke the maiden in January and then went into the Pataglia Memorial and won that. Had only tried that synthetic, though, so that was a question that had to be answered, and it was nicely yesterday, and Sino getting it done. The wine steward running nicely. Dilger at 36-1 to 1 ran third. Liberal Arts, who was a little bit interesting, uh, I, like Hades, disappointed. Hades, seventh Liberal Arts uh, runs sixth in there, so again, he was a little bit of a disappointment also. But Encino, as I say, is now sitting just... Uh, on the definition of the bubble, he's 21 of 20 uh, as far as points in the Derby. And again, deterministic is in that 20, but he's a little bit iffy. And it always seems like endlessly, I wonder, you know, they when they first came out of the win at Turfway, they said, you know, we're going to stick to the dirt. But then you get points and you get a shot at the Derby. They kind of said, well, maybe we're going to go. But I could see them maybe going one way or the other. And also just... Somebody gets a ding or doesn't work well and they step out. We, we don't want that to happen. But you also, I think, have occasionally the, the connections to just say, you know what, the, the, it's, it would be fun to be in the derby, but let's get realistic if you're down there, down the points list, and you're just kind of sneaking in. And you, as I say, you, you smell the coffee and get realistic. We'll see if that happens. Uh, but you would think Encino stands a pretty good chance of getting in. And again, Brad Cox said after – I'll have to talk with the Godolphin people, see what the game plan is. First, they have to get in, and then they have to decide. But he said, you know, likely it's either going to be the Derby or the uh, Preakness for uh, Encino. And uh, Mike Maker, trainer of the Wine Store, that I've said this many, many times. The Wine Store is New York bread, so they, they have all kinds of options going forward with this one because they can choose just to come to New York and and shoot for New York bread steaks, which they've already won. They won the funny side uh, at Saratoga last August. And, you know, they could come up and try the Albany this year. Or, but you have a nice New York bread that can do uh, what we've seen this horse do now in the last couple of starts at Keeneland. Um, take your shots at open company too. And, and I wouldn't say there was from the, Quote I read, there was no kind of a commitment, but Mike Maker was saying, essentially, we have plenty of options. We'll figure it out. The Preakness is one of those possible 
uh, option. So we'll see what the, the game plan is going forward for the wine steward. But again, nice little seasonal debut for that one. But Encino, well, only the fourth career start. I mean, I liked them yesterday. I was a little bit disappointed, as I say, with the price. Um, but I don't, I don't know. That I'd be super enthusiastic about them in the uh, in the Derby. In the Preakness, it, it, he might be interesting, but in the Derby, I'm not quite as certain. All right, the uh, <laughs> got a, a little buzz uh, on social media with the results of the uh, the Jenny Wiley. Um, I. I use surge capacity, one of the Chad Brown runners over Gina Romantica, one of the Chad Brown runners, Didia, certainly uh, very talented, having won the, the Pegasus Philly and Mayor Turf in the previous start. Chad also had fluffy socks in there. Uh, but Chad also had, he had four in there. Butte Kachi, uh, I think I'm in the ballpark of pro pronouncing that right. Uh, Michael Dubb, Maticat, Louis Lazanero and company, trained by Chad Brown, ridden by Frankie DeTore. At 25 to 1, uh, the number 10 horse with Frankie DeTore on board, who kind of lulls them to sleep, 24 and change, 48 and change, 113, 137, uh, and eventually 142. He had plenty left in the lane. At 25 to 1 for a Chad Brown runner. But again, Chad had surge capacity, Gina Romantica, Fluffy Socks, so on social media, uh, they were saying the other, other, other Chad Brown gets it done at $53.68. English Rose second. Didier ran third. Surge Capacity, who I like, was fourth in here. Fluffy Sox sixth. Uh, Gino Romantica, the second choice at seven to two. Uh, disappointing running seventh in the field of 10. But uh, it, it was Chad Brown, just not with the one expected. Uh, Chad, after the race, was asked uh, in the winner's circle, you know, obviously it surprised the betting public. Did it surprise you? And he said, I, I wasn't surprised the horse won. The horse has plenty of talent. I was surprised the horse did it on the front end. And <laughs> he said, we were coming out of the, the paddock, and Frankie said to me, you know, I think I'm going to go try for the lead. And Chad said, I hesitated. And then I said, I'm not going to tell Frankie to Tory what to do. So he goes out, he gets the lead, he takes him all the way around. And in the winner's circle, he pleases the crowd with the flying dismount. You might be able to find it from Friday on the on Twitter, on social media someplace. But on Friday, Frankie DeTore won at Keeneland, got into the winner's circle. And the crowd clearly are around the winner's circle waiting for the Frankie DeTore flying dismount. And instead, he gets off just in the normal way. A, a jockey gets off a horse, and you could you could audibly hear the crowd go, "Ah!" <laughs> Frankie Dettori immediately picked up on it and was kind of like, "Come on," which I get because that flying dismount, you know, he's ten feet up in the air. That that can't that can't be uh, good on the knees necessarily. So I get it. But uh, the winner's circle for the stakes races out on the, the the grass, and so a little bit of a softer landing. So yesterday he did the flying dismount to the. Uh, uh, pleasure of the crowd. Uh, and he was obviously pleased, and, and Chad was pleased. Uh, his first career, Frankie Dettori's first grade one at Keeneland. <laughs> and they interviewed him off the race, after the race, too, and he said something to the effect of, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, show the, these folks in Kentucky uh, what I can do, because there's a big race coming up down here in a couple of weeks, and I'd uh, like to be involved there. And uh, uh, Gabby got that, I think, was there and said, yeah. If you got to push your resume, uh, that's hard to believe. And so we will see if that works out for Frankie. But it certainly was fun yesterday. Again, for anybody that played that, and for those of us up here at Saratoga, we have seen this scenario before where uh, a nice grass stakes race with multiple Chad Brown entries and one of the longer ones gets it done and everybody says, how did a Chad Brown horse – get away at that price. But uh, once again, it happened uh, yesterday at uh, Keeneland with a $50 Chad Brown runner ridden by Frankie DeTore. So nice win for uh, Butte Catchy. Uh, and again, being a, you know, New York connections and whatnot, I would think uh, seeing that one up at Saratoga is clearly a possibility. Also on the card yesterday at uh, Keeneland, it was 
the Giants Causeway. Uh, we're looking at Phillies and Mayors going five and a half uh, on the grass. Roses for Deborah wound up to be the favorite. I put her at the bottom of my mix. Christophe Clement runner tried the boys in the Breeders' Cup uh, turf sprint in her last start. So had been off since the Breeders' Cup. Ran ninth in there. Tried the boys in the turf monster parks just before that had run third. And prior to that, had won a couple of stakes uh, up at Saratoga against her own sex. Moving in against the Phillies and Mares again yesterday. I was a little bit surprised that she went off the favorite. I thought it was a, a fun competitive field. Um, but she goes off at, uh, what, about 8-5. to five. Love range. Jeremy Plonk like that one uh, from Wesley Ward. Had Jeremy on the show yesterday. She goes off at 7-1. to one. She runs well. Elm Drive, I had that one in my mix coming in from Southern California for Phil D'Amato. Um, she's going to run third in here. My top pick was Play the Music from uh, Mark Cassie. We ran sixth at 8-1, to one, so didn't get uh, the run I wanted out of that one, run, that one. But Roses for Deborah, the number eight horse, nice late run in here to come up, and the chart margin will be a length and a quarter uh, under Irad Ortiz. Uh, again, you got a price of $5.52. Love Reigns, second, Elm Drive, third in there. But Roses for Deborah, back now as a five-year-old mayor and getting the season off to a very good start with the win in the stakes yesterday. And as, as they say, a nice stretch run win there as well. Christophe Clement, runner, uh, another one you would think. Hmm, and a good chance of seeing that one right up the road at Saratoga as well. So, again, things played out nicely. Uh, Oaklawn and Keeneland yesterday as far as players and winners that will be prominent, you would think, going forward. The Lexington had some derby implications. We'll see how that plays out. Derby implications going in and coming out, and we'll see how it plays out exactly with the bubble horse. Uh, that I would think is likely to get a shot. But as I say, as a better, I'm not sure whether in the fourth career start I would be in a, coming off a couple of stakes wins, uh, but I'm not sure how excited I'd be about Encino in the Derby. In the Preakness, the horse might be interesting. So it'll be interesting to see, again, A, if he gets in, and B, if they elect to uh, take the shot. You would think, though, with Godal, I would think if they get in, the, the, there's a good chance they, they do take the shot. Uh, I wanted to show one more from uh, Keeneland going back to Friday, because this, uh, another seasonal debut, very, very nice performance. Uh, Friday at Keeneland, I think they had three scheduled for the turf. Uh, they all went off except for this one, because, again, it was weather day, uh, the weather this week at Keeneland was a little bit wet, um, and that was the same on Friday. But the Makers Mark Mile, they had kept that one on uh, the Turf condition was yielding, and, you know, you always feel like the Europeans may have a little bit of an edge with track conditions like that because they'll run on those kind of things over in Europe more readily than they do here. That said, Master of the Seas for uh, Charlie Appleby and Godolphin, last three starts were in North America, and they were pretty good starts. Won the Woodbine Mile, just missed at Keeneland in the Turf uh, Mile in October, and then won the... Uh, Breeders' Cup mile out at Santa Anita for the last three starts. And as I say, they were all in North America. But it started the career in Europe for Charlie Appleby. This was the seasonal debut, the, the uh, six-year-old debut for Master of the Seas Friday in the Maker's Mark mile. And pretty good-looking debut. Master of the Seas is going to be the number four horse in here. I will also note our friends at West Point Thoroughbred had integration the number eight horse winds up third. Um, and in between those two is number three, Naval Power. Naval Power, another Charlie Appleby horse. So he had a couple of Appleby Europeans running one, two, albeit Master of the Seas, a European, but with already good North American form. And boy, that was a nice performance. Again, the chart margin, two and a quarter. Uh, Naval Power, two and a quarter ahead of the third place finisher, Integration. So it was a Charlie Appleby Exacta. You didn't get a whole lot for it, but you got over $15 for the Appleby Exacta. Master of the Seas paying just over $3.50. Uh, and it sounds like, it doesn't sound like, uh, he essentially said, he's keeping both of these here. 
Charlie Appleby, master of the season, naval power. Uh, and Appleby has been a little bit of a presence at Saratoga. So I would think there's a chance we'll see these, uh, one or the other or both, up at Saratoga. But we will certainly see them running here in the United States between now and Saratoga because his game plan, he seemed to indicate, was going to be to keep these two here. Um, they were talking about a turf stake derby weekend. There was also something in New York that weekend or the next weekend. And he was saying, you know, one or the other or both will look at those races. So um, it got a couple of nice, it, 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 it sounds like Appleby maybe has, because the article I read also mentioned a couple other horses. Sounds like Appleby has a little bit of a spring, summer, and perhaps fall into the Breeders' Cup uh, American string plan. And we'll see how that plays out. And again, how that plays out as well up at Saratoga, because he has had a little bit of a presence there uh, last year, maybe the last couple of years. So again, uh, the, the stakes action played out nicely as far as the various divisions and horses to watch going forward and uh, perhaps up at Saratoga as well. All right, we'll take a break. As promised, when we come back, we'll do a little handicapping for uh, Sunday afternoon. We'll hit on some news and notes and whatnot as well as we continue on a Sunday morning racing across America. Stay tuned. Haven't signed up for a Capital OTB account yet? Now's the time to take advantage of the sign-up bonus. Open up a new account with $200 or more, bet $400 by the end of the month, and receive a bonus $200 into your account. Plus, you can take advantage of everything an OTB account has to offer. Wagering from any device, live streaming, racing info, past performances, online promotions, and more. Sign up today and take advantage of the new account bonus. Details at CapitalOTB.com. Come on. I want sales reports on my desk by Monday. Whoops. My bad. Love racing? RTN brings you every live simulcast on your home television, plus live video streaming and race replays on your PC and mobile devices. To order, visit RTN.TV. RTN, a breed apart. Birdstone is an outside front. They're coming down to the finish. Can Smarty Jones hold on? Here comes Birdstone. Birdstone surges as Birdstone wins the Belmont Stakes. Welcome back to Racing Across America. Seth Merrill in the studio. Thanks for uh, joining us. I um, thought I'd take a look at Keeneland uh, late pick five. And again, not putting a ticket together. I don't have scratches or anything yet. Uh, but just take a look at the uh, sequence. And again, uh, we had the cross-country pick five on Friday. Ap apologies to the team. Uh, I always feel like an apology is necessary if we don't hit and, and score. But that's how these work out, and and you hope to uh, get a, a nice hit and make a lot of money. And we were we were kind of floating around the, uh, the our cross country pick five on Friday involved a couple of races from Aqueduct and three races from Oaklawn. Uh, first two legs were the Aqueduct races. We hit those, and the first leg was okay. I, I want to say eleven dollars, maybe. Second leg was was a favorite. And then I missed the next two. I ran second in the next two at Oakland, so we were done. And then I hit the $40 horse in the final leg at, at Oakland, so it had the potential to be a, a nice hit. But we will try to uh, make a score the next time we, we jump into that uh, cross-country pick five. Again, it was frustrating running uh, close up second in the, the middle two legs that we uh, missed, uh, and then to have the $40 horse score. And that one just got up, but it, it got up. Uh, but again, pick five action at Keeneland today. As I say, uh, not a ticket, but just a look here. Give you some ideas if you want to jump in and play uh, this afternoon down at Keeneland. First leg of that late pick five at Keeneland today will be the fifth race. It's going to go off a little after three o'clock. Mile and a half on the grass for um, non-winners of two other than yeah, vying for $120,000 in non-winners of two. 
in the fifth at Keeneland today. I have it five, three, <laughs> eight, and one. I'm going to put headline news on top. Jimmy Toner runner that overall is lightly raced, clearly, with only uh, six career starts, but has shown some, some flashes of talent uh, going back to Laurel in October. And I think Jimmy Toner has a, if I'm not mistaken, may have a barn at Far Hill, um, Fair Hill. Uh, but then spent the winter down in Florida. So hence the, the Laurel start. But then there were a couple of starts down at Gulfstream, a nice win and a close-up third, and then another start in a stake at Gulfstream, the McDermott, uh, ran six there, but a close-up six. But I think getting back into the more proper non-winners uh, could be a little bit interesting today. Jose Ortiz jumping on board. So I'll take a little shot with headline news. I, I, I don't think the horse is – invincible by any means but off the last couple of starts i think might have a little bit of an edge on this bunch die Vernon and at 12 to 1 billmont runner we have starts so far four of them have been on the dirt and that's the last four debuted on the turf at ellis last july and at that point was in the barn of brad cox didn't show much in that turf start but it was also the career debut improved nicely in the second third start number wise the fourth start uh, was a, a nice win and a non winner so one that was in november then came back in february at Gulfstream and kind of clunk and i just think it's intriguing now that bill mott says uh, off a turf workout down at payson just and what over a week ago they come up to keeneland and say yeah let's try the turf here with a horse that again has shown some flashes of talent and we're getting 12 to one on the morning line and I'm not going to be shocked if our price holds up nicely. So Divern and the three is interesting in that uh, fifth at Keeneland hidden stash hidden stash is an interesting horse to, to me and, and folks may remember, but you go down and it's, it's the last race now showing up on the page. This was a Kentucky Derby starter back in 2021. And at the time, there were some stories, not stories, there, there were things written in the paper, and it was a fact. Uh, Jim Beheim, the, the Syracuse, as a Syracuse grad, that's why I gravitate and remember the story. Jim Beheim had a, a small piece of this horse, one of the uh, Syracuse boosters at the time. Uh, I, I think maybe more of a horse owner uh, and involved in this BBN racing. And he gave Jim Bayham a little piece of his piece, I believe. Um, so it, the horse was a little bit interesting. And as is Jim Bayham still involved? I would assume I give back the piece. I, so I would assume maybe still involved in this horse. But um, you know, obviously uh, being started in the Derby, there were some hopes and dreams for this horse. Didn't quite live up to it, but has shown some ability certainly. And I think in this field is going to fit second start of the season off of June to February layup. Debuted this season down at Tampa. Ran okay. Beaten favorite. Ran okay. But I would think with that one under the belt, uh, could run well this afternoon. And I always say the Vicky Oliver horses are always a little bit intriguing to me as well. Six minus is uh, interesting. Todd Pletcher training. Again, this is a mile and a half. So we're getting to those marathonish type distances. And you go down the page, and this horse has tried two miles and a mile and three-eighths and a mile and a half further down the page. So this horse, six minus for Rapoli, Pletcher and company, I think just on the experience of the trip is a little bit interesting. And Irod Ortiz is in the saddle. So the fifth at Keeneland for me, I have a five, three, eight, and one. Keeneland's sixth race today. Uh, they're on the main track at eight and a half furlongs. These are $50,000 plain vanilla claimers. Three, eight, two, and nine in the sixth at Keeneland. Number three is blown cover. Goes out for uh, Brad Cox. <coughs> Excuse me, the uh, fifth career start and getting some notable class relief. The first start was a maiden breaker against Maiden Special Company at Indiana. And again, this is one of those horses. Jeremy Plonk talked about this yesterday. A lot of times, uh, folks will look at the Indiana runners for Brad Cox and think, "Oh, second string." Well, th this horse, I think, is is you know, broke the maiden at, at Indiana, but then came to, down to the fairgrounds in a third and a second in some optional claimers, wasn't in for the tag. Last time out at Oaklawn, kind of clunked running seven. So they drop in for 50000 today. It's Spendthrift and Company. They paid a lot of money for this horse. 
and and again off a debut win, obviously some expectations. Just quite hasn't lived up to it. So with these kind of connections, I think they're willing to say, let's get a win. If we keep the horse, great. If we don't, fine. So I think blown cover is uh, logical here on the class move. JT's imagination in the second spot. Joe Sharp, uh, runner, coming out of an optional claimer starter allowance down at the fairgrounds, was in for the tag, but had a voided claim last time. So, again, you have to uh, wonder about that situation, but comes in in decent form. The two fairground starts were a couple of nice second-place finishes and I think is a good fit with this field and in decent form. Uh, so I'll, I'll tilt uh, towards using that one in the mix and Montevallo in the third spot. Comes in from three starts at uh, Turfway for Owen Hardy. The last being a maiden breaker for a 30 tag, but also it was around two turns. Uh, it was the third career start. It was a little bit of class relief. There were some things that that maybe explain that, that maybe make you question today, but also maybe make you feel okay because the last was at the distance. But again, it was at a reduced rate. But I also like the bullet workout. I thought uh, the bullet workout just, uh, what, about six days, five days ago uh, over at Turfway kind of showed a little intent today. And 15 to 1 with that bullet work and a win in the last start, I thought Montevallo was uh, definitely one to take a look at in the sixth at Keeneland. I have a 3, 8, 2, and 9. Race number seven at Keeneland this afternoon. Again, another non-winners. This one, non-winners are one vying for $110,000 back on the grass, a mile and an eighth here in the seventh. And again, should I would assume with the weather yesterday and they were on the turf, I would assume that they'll stick on. Um, but should things change and, and I have the feed up there, it looks like another sunny day. Uh, but if it should change, I have dirt selections over on the one sheet. This race, I didn't change one way or the other. There, again, there are races where there are Horses that clearly have dirt form. There are, horse, there are races with main track only, um, but horses also that have clear dirt form. Sometimes that's not the case, so I'll just stick. So turf or dirt, I was still in the seventh at Keeneland, 12, 10, 7, and 8. I, I will readily admit, at the mile and an eighth on the turf, I'm not thrilled I'm hung outside with my top two, but not in a million years. It's Chad Brown, it's Peter Brand, it's Irod Ortiz, a horse that in the last couple of starts – of the three-year-old season last year seemed to kind of come to hand and show a little bit of ability and enough ability that being lightly raced some time off and a little bit of a move forward is going to put this horse right in the thick of things here. And I think all of that is possible with this one, but I am concerned about the outside post position. Last call also kind of hung to the outside. Joel Rosario on board for Jonathan Thomas hasn't been seen since Keeneland last year. You go down the page, there's some pretty good tries, and pretty good tries in uh, Stakes Company. Now, will we get that off the layoff? I don't know. Uh, the workouts underneath don't seem to be indicating one way or the other, but it's a nice steady string of workouts. So I think if the horse is fit and ready, can be a player in here. But again, uh, also is going to have to overcome the outside post position, so that's the knock. And then a couple that have slightly better post positions, the seven and the eight, the seven Zippadoo going out for Grand Motion hasn't been seen since late January down at Gulfstream. Eh, you know, it was a little bit of a uninspiring seventh place finish, but in the Tropical Park Oaks before that, tossed a decent number, wound up eighth. But again, it was a number that's going to mix it up with this crew. And, and I will say, this seems to be... One of those groups, I was going to say evenly matched, and it is, it's one of those groups where you can kind of point to things that jump off the past performances. And on this race, this couple of races, I can go here, and then there are maybe more recent races where you, you're kind of, uh, but in the recent form. So it, it's just who's going to come out, who's going to feel it, who's going to get a good trip uh, and whatnot. Uh, for, but for me, in the uh, seventh at Keeneland, 12, 10, 7, and 8. Eighth race this afternoon at Keeneland, we are uh, looking at starter allowance types going seven furlongs. And in the eighth at Keeneland, I'm three, five, four, and eight. Mac Daddy, two, coming up from Oaklawn early in the meet. The Oaklawn runners seem to be doing uh, well. 
This one at Oaklawn in the latest start ran in a very similar conditioned race and just missed. Uh, two starts back, won a claimer at the 20 level. So to go from that 20 level into a starter 20 is, you know, a move I would think into salt, saltier company and seem to go well there. I think we'll go well here. Norm Cassie trainee. And again, on the move from Oaklawn with Oaklawn runners doing okay. I think uh, Mac Daddy too is uh, interesting. Now, short price on the morning line. We'll see what we go off at. I wouldn't want this horse to, to get too short because I think this one pretty similar in talent to Pure Panic, the uh, five horse. This one coming in off a couple of tries at Turfway most recently with solid numbers and a couple of okay third place finishes. But third start back off a little bit, you know, a couple of months on the sidelines, uh, third start back, Tyler Gaffleone on board. So, again, I think the three and the five are pretty similar. So it, it'll be interesting to see whether that's reflected in the odds or one or the other starts to separate. And the other, you know, the longer one maybe becomes a little more intriguing on the price. In the third and the fourth spot, I have a couple of Juan uh, Cano uh, runners, the four and the eight, Solidify and Voodoo Zip. And again, I think you can find races on the page for both of them and recent races on the page for both of them that stack up with the top two. So as I say, I like Mac Daddy too. At two to one on uh, short price on the morning line, I don't want to lose too much value. I don't want this one going down too much because I think really the top four are all players in here, certainly – uh, if they're firing their best efforts. So the eighth at Keeneland for me, three, five, four, and eight. And finally, we'll wrap things up at Keeneland this afternoon, about a quarter after five for race number nine, mile and a half on the grass for non-winners of two other than I'm one, seven, six, and 11. Ohana honor going out for our friends at West Point and uh, company. Shug McGahee, trainee, coming up from a seasonal debut beginning of March at Gulfstream that I thought was an okay effort. Solid number. Uh, the horse has shown some talent underneath, has been able to string some together previously. So we'll see if this horse can uh, put in a nice effort again here. And I think the mile and a half might be a little bit interesting for Ohana Honor in the uh, ninth at Keeneland. Foreign relations going out. Uh, under Tyler Gaffleone this afternoon. Hasn't been seen since last October, but has been running at these types of distances, a mile and a half and whatnot, and in four tries at a mile and a half, a win in a second place finish. You know, these marathons are kind of a specialty, and this horse has shown the ability to do it. Now, will we do it off a layoff? I don't know, but another one with a steady string of workouts underneath and prep. Regal Kingdom going out for Graham Motion, 12-1 to 1 on the morning line, also coming in off of uh, that same race as the top pick at Gulfstream last time. Top pick ran third. Uh, Regal Kingdom ran sixth in there. But I just think this one, off of that effort, which was a lifetime best buyer, signaled that maybe as a four-year-old, maybe ready to move forward a little bit. and could be kind of intriguing in here at what I think will be a little bit of a price. Again, 12 to 1 on the morning line. I think we'll hold up at some decent value with the Grand Motion Runner, who, again, may have a little upside potential in the second start back of what might be an improved four-year-old season. In the uh, ninth at Keeneland, I have it 1, 7, 6, and 11. All right, we'll take another break. When we come back, we'll uh, take a look at some news and notes and whatnot right after uh, – you catch these messages as we continue on this Sunday morning racing across America. Stay tuned. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. You'll get live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, a simple, safe and secure wagering platform. And best of all, you get track prices. CapitalOTBBet.com. Bet any place, anytime at CapitalOTBBet.com. And be sure to download our new mobile app from the iTunes Store or Google Play. What if there was a way to become a better horse player, to have a better knowledge of the game, to be more successful? What if there were a way to take what you've learned, what you know, and make better decisions, better choices? In horse racing, knowledge is a powerful tool. 
race results and replays, past performances and live streaming, wagering from all your digital devices. Capital OTB, become a better horse player. 20. Want to get your career in horse racing off to a fast start? Well, the University of Arizona's Racetrack Industry Program is your winning ticket. The Racetrack Industry Program has served as a springboard to some of the industry's most successful individuals with a proven track record of job placement right out of college. If you want to earn a degree in the exciting horse racing industry, the Racetrack Industry Program can put you in the winner's circle. Welcome back. Uh, I've been searching Twitter during the breaks and, and came up with buyers uh, for yesterday. Um, and I'm looking at the Twitter feed from uh, the Spanish uh, version of DRF, which I would assume are official numbers. Um, you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, as I say, DRF on Espanol, uh, the, again, with the DRF symbol and everything, I think this is just the Spanish side of uh, the racing form. And yesterday at uh, Keeneland, Roses for Deborah, 100 uh, buyer figure for uh, Roses for Deborah. Um, so solid number there. And I'm just checking to see how that matches up with what we've seen uh, from her before. Um, I don't have her. Wait a minute. There we go. Uh, so she has, uh, going back to the smart and fancy, in fact, it's Saratoga, a 102 buyer. That's the only triple digit showing on the resume. So to come back from a layoff, the Breeders' Cup, and and click another uh, triple digit buyer, 100 for Roses for Deborah, uh, I would think bodes well for her. Butte Cachet, uh, the, uh, the other, other, other Chad Brown runner, a 95, and Encino, a 94 buyer, which is a lifetime best for uh, him. And Sino uh, on the buyer scale so far in the four starts, 65 in the debut, 68 in the maiden breaker, 89 in the Battaglia, and now yesterday a 94. Uh, and, and, you know, given what we've seen so far from the three-year-olds, that's for the most part, a pretty good number. There are some triple digits amongst the, the three-year-olds, but not a, a whole lot. And so I think the 94 is okay. Again, enough to pull me towards the using that horse in the derby. I don't think so. But, uh, you know, it, again, it's a move forward. And with the crop so far this year, a decent little number. Yesterday at uh, Oaklawn, Skelly gets a, a 103. No surprise off a really nice performance. And Skelly has tossed a number of triple digits, including a couple of 105s, the King Cotton uh, earlier in the meet at Oaklawn. And, uh, oh, last year in the in the Count Fleet ran a 105. But the 103, particularly off the return from uh, Saudi Arabia, that's a pretty good number for Skelly. And Adair Manor in the uh, Apple Blossom, Adair Manor, uh, a solid 100 buyer for her. And she's another one that doesn't have a lot of triple-digit buyers on the resume. But last time out in the Beholder Mile, she ran a 102. Uh, so now she's paired up triple digits uh, for the first time in the career, gotten triple digits and paired them up in her first two starts as a five-year-old. And it's kind of interesting. Bob Baffert was quoted in one of the articles I, I read as the, the owner came and said, you know, after last season, should we keep going? And Baffert said, you know, she's a big horse. I think she's going to get better. I, I think we could have a pretty good season with her. And now uh, two for uh, two triple-digit buyers. She ran second uh, in the Beholder Mile, but a couple of triple-digit buyers and, and a win in the Apple Grade 1 Apple Blossom. That kind of panned out nicely for keeping her on the racetrack, certainly. So, again, there are your uh, buyer numbers from yesterday, all kind of validating. Those were interesting performances that uh, will bode well, uh, you would think, for the future of uh, those runners in the various divisions. Uh, I'd mentioned it earlier. I'll, I'll take a closer look at the uh, the top 20 here points-wise, but I mentioned it earlier on the Derby points list. Encino with 40 sits at 21. There is a, a Japanese runner, 
there are a couple there i don't know one or two or what there there's japanese race or races that qualify a japanese runner to get in so there's a horse called to password that uh has been the japanese qualifier so that one's listed at the bottom of the list with no points but there's a and i think they do if i'm not mistaken i think the japanese pools and and the japanese folks are horse racing fans and like to bet and so you you would love to have them participating in your pools but i think if I'm not mistaken, I think I've read in the past that Japanese law, I believe, says that they can't import a foreign signal and let people bet into it unless there's a Japanese runner. So, I, you know, you may say, why does the Jer Derby let this Japanese horse take it away? Well, uh, it, it, it'll make all of us happy if millions more dollars go into the pool and help the odds. And, you know, the Japanese runners go for this one and, and help our odds. Now, I would I will say... We, this year, they didn't necessarily have to do that because Forever Young is in, and Forever Young probably is going to take way more money than Dio Passport, probably justifiably so, and maybe stands a good chance to win. The way the Japanese runners have been going internationally over the past few years, Forever Young, the undefeated Japanese horse, he doesn't, he didn't make it in as the Japanese runner though, because as I say, this year he's, he was undefeated in Japan. But I don't know whether he ran in those Derby quad. I'm not sure what the Derby qualifying races are. He was over in Saudi Arabia and then uh, Dubai winning there instead. So that's why he didn't become the automatic Japanese runner. Uh, but Forever Young is way up the list at 100. Endlessly, again, it's going to be interesting. He's sitting seventh on the list. Will they elect to go or will they kind of go with their first intuition and go to uh, the turf? deterministic has been kind of uh, talked about as one way or the other. We'll see. Uh, Dornock is uh, in here. I'll, I'll go down the, the, the list. Sierra Leone is at the top of the list now with fierceness second. And again, this is the points list. Catching freedom third, stronghold. Uh, resilience. Resilience is interesting. And with that woodwind bounced up to number five on the points list. Forever Young, Endlessly, Doorknock, Just a Touch, Track Phantom. And then you get down to some horses that, <coughs> for the most part, I, I don't know that I'm super excited. I think they're interesting horses and will be interesting the rest of the year. Just Steel at 12 may be the interesting part of the second 10. But the number 11 is West Saratoga, then Just Steel, Honor Marie, Domestic Product. Again, and that uh, Tampa Bay Derby, I wasn't super excited about. Catalytic. I took a shot with that one in the Florida Derby and I was happy with the second, but I don't know if that's enough to get me going in the Derby. Deterministic, uh, number 16 on the points list, Society Man, Mystic Dan, No More Time, and then the Japanese RTO password. And that, that's the top 20. And then Encino, after the win yesterday, sitting at 21. So, you know, there, there are a couple in here who are – have the potential to, to step aside. And again, with a couple of weeks, who knows? So Encino might uh, get in sooner rather than later, but then we have to see what the connections decide to do. And again, the siren call of the Derby is so strong. It would shock me if they took their pop. Uh, pulled up the uh, NTRA uh, polls, which come out on Monday. So it'll be interesting to see. I, I, I'm i guessing, I don't think anything this weekend would have significantly changed the, the two polls. But I found it interesting. This time of year, I think they do the three-year-old poll through the Triple Crown. And then it, it's just, then they just have the top thoroughbreds. But at this time of year, they have a three-year-old poll and a, an overall thoroughbred poll. And I found the the three-year-old poll, interesting. And again, this came out last Monday. It'll come out tomorrow as well. It comes out every Monday. Uh, but again, I don't think anything, you know, I don't think Encino is going to juggle up the list at all. Uh, but last week, uh, the voters decided Sierra Leone over fierceness. And I was a little bit surprised uh, about that. And the vote total 315 to 304 but the number of first place votes was separated pretty significantly. First place votes for Sierra Leone, 21. First for Fierceness, 11. 
Muth got a first place vote as well. He sits third on the list, but I was a little bit surprised. And that was a juggle from the week before. The week before Fierceness was over, Sierra Leone. So I found that a little bit surprising. Catching Freedom fourth, Stronghold fifth, Nysos uh, sixth, Forever Young seventh, Resilience eighth, Just a Touch ninth, and Endlessly tenth uh, in there. Uh, again, the uh, three-year-old list with Sierra Leone over uh, fierceness. The overall list, Senior Buscador, uh, good for the, the horse and the connections, you know, the connections that aren't quite as well known and a horse kind of with connections based in the Southwest and, uh, but with the, the, <laughs> the, you know, the international uh, win this year. Senior Buscador on top, National Treasure second. I will say, when you look down and you look at some of the records currently of these horses, and this is this is an annual poll, so we're just looking at the performances this year. You get down to the third place finisher, Idiomatic, no starts this year. Uh, White Obario, fourth, one start this year. So this, this list has plenty of opportunity and expectation to change up in the next you know, couple of months as some of these horses start to get a little more uh, experience uh, this year under their belt. But again, for top four, Senior Buscador, National Treasure, Idiomatic, White of Barrio. Then we move on to number five, Saudi Crown. First mission, Newgate, Warm Heart, I'm, I'm Very Busy, and Laurel River, who uh, two for three this year and this one we will not see boy experience as they don't plan to show up again until uh, uh, Dubai next year. That was the weirdest decision, but a dirt horse and they're kind of based over there. Uh, so Laurel River, strange. Uh, you you would think they would kind of well, let's take our shot and go over and try a couple of nice races in the United States and maybe go in the Breeders' Cup. But I guess I guess you, you score. In a twenty million dollar race, you can take a take a semi retire and come back a year later. So, uh, all right, we'll take uh, a break. We'll actually wrap it up. We'll take a break. It, we are taking a break, but we're wrapping up this show. But I'll be back in an hour and a half or so for OTB Live for a, a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I have a little Aqueduct in Keeneland uh, on tap for today. Um, I don't know. Say Oaklawn yesterday. I didn't look. At, maybe I'll print up some Oaklawn and we'll look at that uh, today as well. But We'll also have some Saratoga Harness in the mix uh, this afternoon. So it should be a fun day uh, on this Sunday afternoon. Don't forget, we'd love to have you here at the Clubhouse Racebook. If you like the golf, you can come down and watch the golf, and maybe you can putt for some prizes. We'll select people randomly throughout the afternoon. We have our little putting green uh, up in front, and uh, you get to step up and putt for prizes. That's this afternoon here at the Clubhouse Racebook. And I stepped up yesterday, and I – I put it a couple in, so it's very doable. Come on down, have a little extra fun this afternoon at the Clubhouse Race Book. All right, wrapping it up for a Sunday morning racing across America. Seth Merrill in the studio. Again, thanks for joining us. We'll be back in, as I say, about an hour and a half or so to kick things off a Sunday afternoon OTV Live. Make sure you're back tuned in for that, and we'll see you then. You're watching OTV TV. A service of Capital Off-Track Betting.